my name's John Bridal and uh, I'm a biologist in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Bristol. And my research is mostly about understanding uh, how organisms evolve in response to environmental change and how quickly they can do that. Climate change is having big effects on biodiversity. It's causing losses of biodiversity at precisely the time when we need the biodiversity to allow us to support a growing population. And the big problem is climate change is affecting um, the people that depend most directly on biodiversity are the poor of this planet. And those people are not are being massively affected by climate change and we're buffered from it in the, in the, the more sort of uh, wealthy parts of the world. So from my point of view, I think the big interesting thing is how there's now been a connection between development and biodiversity. Protecting biodiversity is essential for development, essential for social justice and poverty alleviation, and that connection wasn't really made before. People thought that protecting biodiversity was like an alternative to development. But it's not the environment or development. The environment is the economy. It's what makes development possible. I think that's the big message, that biodiversity is not like protecting some pandas so we can go and look at them. It's about protecting the systems that actually we depend on to make... I mean, it's not as if life's going to end because of climate change, but human life is going to become a lot harder. Um, a lot of species are going to go with us. Um, and the poor of this planet and our grandchildren, so the, the unborn generations who don't have any say in how we govern the planet now, are definitely going to have a much more impoverished life because of the actions of the last 50, 100 years. I think from a climate change point of view, it's like, how could you think that you were going to burn billions of years' worth of accumulated carbon from a period when the Earth was incredibly productive during the carboniferous high temperatures, lots of rain? How could you think you'd burn and release that into the atmosphere over such a short period and it wouldn't affect the climate? I mean, I don't think the onus from us should be to prove that climate change is happening. It's like releasing all that fossilised carbon into the atmosphere, and something that's already at very, such a low abundance in the atmosphere, increasing its doubling or you know, increasing its abundance when it's already very rare, seems to be a very dangerous thing to do. So I don't see how people could think that, that we wouldn't affect the climate in some way, and we've got all the evidence that, that we are affecting the climate. The issue that I'm interested in is how those changes that are projected are going to affect the systems we depend on for, for our food and for our well-being, and that's biological systems. I think it's important that we're mostly dealing initially with climate scientists in terms of understanding what um, the likely rates of change are going to be, the sort of average changes across years in temperature and how that's being forced by greenhouse emissions. And so understanding the, the mechanism by which the climate is changing is very important. But even if, even if we have a great deal of certainty of, an, of exactly how much the temperature is going to likely to change in the next 50 years, the upper and lower bounds of that, we still know remarkably little about how those changes are going to affect populations of organisms and communities and ecosystems. And I think although the idea of tsunamis and, uh, and storms and floods looms very large in the public imagination, most people's experience of climate change is going to be by the way it affects food security, the way that it affects ecosystems and organisms. And we know that organisms face environmental changes all the time. We know that they're dealing with the environment changing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. The issue is how much climate change is going to take that beyond the bounds that they're used to experiencing. I mean, especially in seasonal environments, organisms deal with winter time and summer time, and they have all kinds of interesting adaptations to cope with that. But what's happening with climate change is the extremes are increasing. We're getting more variable climates and less predictable climates. But I think what we really miss in terms of predicting how organisms will respond to climate change and how that's going to affect the types of outputs we rely on for our human economies, like farming, for food security, um, predicting when diseases are going to emerge, you know, the emergence of diseases, the spread of diseases through invasions. We really need to understand the biology. And the difficulty there is that organisms experience the environment in a very local way. They experience it you know, on, across metres, not hundreds of metres, and across hours and minutes. And they can change their behaviour to change how they experience the environment. They can choose where they lay their eggs, or they can choose when they go into diapause. So they have a certain amount of plasticity to cope with the environmental change they're facing. But the issue is that the environment is changing in a much less predictable way from their point of view. These cues they were using are becoming no longer reliable cues that tell them when they should emerge to synchronise with other organisms or when they're going to be free from frost. So the persistence of organisms in most parts of the world depends on them being able to cope with environmental variation. But climate change is changing the way that variation is being experienced. And we know virtually, we know very little about how organisms experience that just as individuals. 
And on top of that, you have the idea of genetic variation. The organism is actually different how they deal with the environment. And that gives you the capacity for them to actually evolve in response to change. That's the main issue that my research really addresses, is trying to understand what limits a population's responses to environmental variation. So I think one of the issues is that we think about species as single units. And this is why perhaps we've lost or missed this evolutionary aspect of responses to climate change. We know that organisms are distributed in space and have limits to where they're found. That's determined by their niche, you know, what they can cope with. But we don't know how much they vary across their range as individual populations. They've been responding historically to changes. You know, what happens in Canada is different to what happens in, in Latin America. You know, it could have the same species with a very broad distribution. But those populations could be very different in the niches they inhabit. So that in itself is testament to the fact that organisms have responded to environmental change across their distribution. They often have clines, they often have changes in characters which tell us that they can respond to some change. But what really fascinates me as a scientist is why at the edge of their distribution do they stop adapting? We know that over longer timescales organisms have been able to go into I mean, mammals returned to the ocean several times and we colonised the oceans, became completely marine. So clearly these niche barriers can be overcome given enough time but probably that happens only very rarely. So I'm really interested in what, is, what are the factors that limit how fast organisms can respond to change. They have this plastic variability, so they have an ability to kind of use the environment in different ways. They respond to cues, and they vary in the way they respond to cues. And that kind of plasticity gives you a resilience just without necessarily evolving. But also those cues can evolve. How you use the environment, how you respond to the environment can evolve as well. And we're really interested in understanding when the, if the environment changes too fast, where the populations are not able to keep up with, to track that changing environment sufficiently fast before their population declines. So this is a concept that's called evolutionary rescue. The idea that when a population is in an environment and the environment changes suddenly, under what conditions can it evolve, change the gene frequencies in its population to allow it to match that new optimum and thereby continue to grow and continue to be sustained. And fundamental to that idea is the idea that when the population uh, experiences a new environment, its growth rate declines because it's far from the optimum, so many organisms are unable, unable to grow as quickly or reproduce as quickly as they were before. So this feedback between your distance from the optimum of the population and your growth rate is really what determines the limit to evolution. It's the way that your um, growth rate declines as, you, as the environment changes and how much genetic change is needed to allow you to get to that new optimum. Because that genetic change, the time it takes for that to happen, that's all the time when the population is suffering reduced size. And that reduced size feed back, feeds back and reduces the genetic variation. So it actually makes it even harder for it to evolve. So it's a kind of like a, if you don't evolve quickly, while well, the population size is still large and the population declines, then you're losing variation to allow you to continue to adapt. So it's kind of like a bit of a, a sort of positive feedback. You know, the rescue has to happen fairly early on, we think. So we have very good theoretical models for the situations under which evolution can occur the sort of maximum sustainable rate of adaptation. And we can look at populations and how they're distributed now and tell us, well, in the past, what have they been able to respond to, um, how much they vary across their range and their niche, which tells us the kind of range that they can clearly evolve into these new niches. But we don't know a lot of these key parameters like the growth rate, the amount of how, how strong selection is in the field, how it varies with the varying environment. We don't have good estimates in the real world of those things because actually they're quite hard to measure. But we don't even know very much about how much genetic variation there is within populations or between populations, which, will, which is the fundamental engine that allows organisms to evolve. Without genetic variation, variation in reproductive success, there's no evolution. Evolution stops. So we need to understand more about how genetic variation is distributed across populations and within populations, so across families, essentially. And we also need to know how changing in one direction, so evolving one type of morphology or one type of response, may limit your ability to respond in another way. And this comes into this idea of trade-offs, which is the idea that you can't be everything at once. And fundamentally that's why organisms have, you know, why organisms are, are diverse, why they've gone into different niches and proliferated into the biodiversity that we see, is because one species can't do everything. So they evolve, you know, a larger body size, it means they have a, a longer gestation time and they can't reproduce as quickly. So you have these kind of trade-offs that, that are involved throughout history. And by understanding those trade-offs, we can maybe start to understand more about 
what limits organisms responding to environmental change. And we've actually got an incredible new ways of doing that now with next generation sequencing. The sort of genomics revolution has allowed us to study organisms in the wild and actually look at how the genetic basis of the variation that affects their fitness in natural populations. And there's been some fantastic studies that have been done on that. Really, from a biological point of view, it's like we've just discovered the telescope, like in the 16th century, you know. So we are now able to do things in a few weeks that previously would have taken us several years. And so the ability to actually address these really quite difficult questions is now with us in terms of genomics, but we need more and more studies in the field that actually tell us how what's really limiting organisms' ranges, the degree to which their responses to the environment are affected by extremes in particular is a key issue. Like we know they respond in space, but they experience the environment in a very local, very temporally changing way that changes over time. And what climate change is doing is it's increasing the probability of extreme events. So that not only is the mean changing, and the mean is changing actually doesn't seem that much, a few degrees, but the probability of extreme 15 degree differences is becoming much more frequent. And what interests me is how do organisms evolve to things that they've never experienced before? If they've only experienced it once in the last sort of 5,000 years, that kind of temperature or that kind of event, how can they possibly have evolved the ability to be resilient to that change? Yes, yes. Um, well, I, I should say first of all that I think, you know, the focus on, returning back to what I was saying before about climate scientists, I think the focus on demonstrating there's been a temperature change, and the surface temperature change or oceanic temperature change is all fine. But we can look at biological organisms and see them responding to climate change. What we see actually when we look across thousands of species is their ranges are all shifting polewards. So in the southern hemisphere they're shifting towards Antarctica and in the northern hemisphere they're shifting towards the Arctic. And they're becoming extinct at their southern margins in the northern hemisphere and, and move shifting northwards. And that's a clear ecological response to climate change. Organisms are moving into habitats that are now becoming suitable for them at the northern edge of their range in Europe and they're declining or moving up onto mountain tops in the southern parts of their range and that's something that we work on in butterflies because we know a lot about butterflies ecology and about the habitats that they use, the interactions they have with other species and also about their historical distribution. So a lot of work has been done on butterflies in this area. So we know there are definitely, you know, across, there's a signature, a very strong signature across the globe of, of organisms responding to climate change by shifting. So there's definitely something going on. It's unequivocal. I've never met a biologist who doesn't believe that the things are changing. The question is how fast and um, how much is that average change um, interacting with changes on a very local scale. And that's something that takes a lot of work to understand because organisms are complex, they have individual behaviour that varies. Our butterflies, for example, that we work on a UK species of butterfly, the brown argus. And that's a butterfly that can change where it lays its eggs. Um, and actually butterflies in general, if they choose to lay their eggs, you know, five centimetres off the, off the ground, they're, they're, the eggs are going to experience a much lower temperature than if they lay them on the ground. It's a five or six degrees difference on average, and that's work that's been done in the States on um, a checker spot butterfly. And that shows like a, you know, an incredible ability of organisms to choose by, by the maternal behaviour to affect the microclimate that their offspring are going to grow in. Now knowing that on average across this latitude of the US there's going to be a change of two degrees centigrade doesn't tell you what the individual organisms are going to do on the ground. Um, so there are definitely strong signatures of ecological responses. So organisms are shifting their ranges. We don't know if they're actually changing, for many of those organisms we don't know if they're actually changing their habitat requirements or they're actually changing their niches, which is what evolution would do. It would change what their tolerances are. We can actually say, well, actually, that a lot of them are doing sort of pretty much what they're moving to areas that would have been habitable before. So they're moving into areas which um, are just the same as the areas they were previously living in. Do you see what I mean? So they, they haven't changed their niche. They're just kind of passively, not passively, but they're kind of tracking the change. But the general pattern that we see is actually that most generalist species are able to do that. So species that have large population sizes, that don't have specific requirements for other species, don't have particular interactions with other species that they exploit. So in butterflies, some species are pretty generalist about the host plants that they use for their larvae to grow on, and others are a bit more specialised, they need certain types of habitat where these particular plants grow. And those organisms with very particular habitat types that they require tend to be not expanding their ranges or not shifting their ranges, and that seems to be because they're very limited by habitat availability. So you have this kind of double whammy of like the anthropogenic 
change of the environment causing things to have to move, but habitat loss on a local scale restricting their ability to shift their ranges. So most generalist, most specialist species of butterfly are actually declining, about 75% of specialist species are declining, um, they're becoming increasingly trapped in sort of fragmented, locally cool places, rather than expanding their ranges into areas that are now suitable for them further north. And the butterfly species that we work on, the brown argus, is in a very interesting example because it seems to have shifted its range northwards despite having particular habitat requirements. So in most of its range in the south, it uses a host plant called rock rose, which is a um, cystaceae family of plant. So it's quite different. It's quite a particular plant that grows on chalk downland. Um, but it's a, spa it's, a it's a specialist species in a way in that it uses mostly this host plant. Yet it hasn't and yet it has been able to shift its range northwards in Britain. It seems to have been able to do that by actually evolving to specialise on a different host in the new part of the range and so use that uh, on, on Geronaceae species like geranium, which are found in very different types of habitat, have a very different type of microclimate, we think, and a very type of different type of growth form, they're a very different family of plant. And yet it seems to have had an evolutionary response very quickly that's allowed it to colonise this new area. So that's one example. I mean, there are lots of examples of uh, changes in organisms, but it's often quite difficult to distinguish those changes that you see in the field um, from just plastic changes, from the idea they've just evolved to use the environment slightly differently. They haven't actually evolved. So there's lots of examples in mammals where they've shifted their range. But knowing the degree to which evolution is responsible for allowing that change to happen, or conversely, the degree, the degree to which evolution means they don't have to shift their ranges as much. You know, maybe they can just move, you know, half as far because they can evolve to cope with a warmer temperature. So when species are lagging behind and not tracking the environment exactly, is that because they've evolved locally? Often we just don't know. So there's a big knowledge gap in understanding the way that evolution allows resilience in terms of allowing populations to respond to climate change and rescuing them from just contracting and becoming trapped in local places. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge area that we, we don't really... Now that we have the genomic tools, it's going to become a lot easier to demonstrate um, that, evolution that evolution has actually happened. But just looking in the field and saying they're, they're now here and they were there, things like mammals and birds, you know, you, it's hard to bring them into the laboratory and rear them and show that they've genetically changed in these traits. And often the changes are things like changes in the way they react to the environment. So they're, not, um, they're like changes in, in the genes that underlie the plasticity which is much harder to, to detect you know, when you put them in the lab. You have to test them under a whole range of conditions rather than just one particular condition and show that they're different. But pretty much whenever we bring organisms into the lab and rear them, we find that they do have very strong genetic differences in most traits and certainly a lot of capacity to evolve in many traits. The thing that we don't really understand is how those traits correlate with each other and how that might limit their ability to adapt. The issue about whether or not the organism is going to be able to track the environment sufficiently fast, um, I think in many cases they won't be able to. And when we know, for example, that some tree species are still increasing their range in response to glacial changes, post-glacial expansion, some tree species are moving quite slowly. Others are already where you'd expect them to be, given the existing environment. But it's hard often to know exactly what's limiting a species in a particular place. It could be like every 10 years there's a frost and that, that stops the, the sapling, kills all the saplings. Or, Often it's these extreme events that limit species ranges. Um, but I think certainly the rate of, for many organisms, the rate of environmental change is going to be too fast. Again, we're slightly hampered in understanding that fully because we don't know how much it's going to change on a local scale. Organisms may well persist in places just because they're able to use like um, moist microclimates or shaded, they might move to north facing slopes rather than the south facing slopes. So this comes back to this idea of needing to understand this very local um, way that the environment is changing. Um, certainly, as I say, in butterflies, 75% of the species we define as specialists that have particular species they depend on, their ranges haven't tracked, they haven't responded to climate change effectively. They are effectively condemned to extinction in increasingly fragmented patches. So, and that's basically what, what we're seeing across most species that have particular species they need to interact with because those species have to expand as well. And often those species, like if they're plants, might be limited by soil type or by you know, some other feature of the environment, not by temperature. And that will mean that unless they shift their niches to use different plants, they won't be able to actually persist in that place.
I mean, there was a famous study done in 2004 by Chris Thomas, which caused a lot of discussion, where he modelled um, a species as a sort of single unit. Like, like I was talking about before, the problem is we assume species have got the same niche everywhere. But he assumed, let's assume that the species has basically got the same niche everywhere, which is basically quite conservative. You're saying actually you're giving it a lot of latitude to evolve, because you're saying, well, every population has all the genes it needs to move, has all the tolerance necessary to move to anywhere in 50 years' time where there's going to be a habitat it can currently inhabit. If, it, if that habitat exists anywhere on the globe, then it can be there. So you assume there's no limitation in how fast they can move or their dispersal, there's no fragmentation, there's no oceans in the way. Um, he basically showed, suggested that 10% of species, of which we had good estimates, would go extinct even if they could get anywhere they wanted to be, simply because those, those habitats would no longer exist. So without evolutionary change, 10% would be condemned to extinction. If you allow there to be some limitation in the rates of movement, that estimate goes up to about 35% of species so within this century. And that's a lot of assumptions in those models, and they've been questioned a lot recently, and they, are, they pertain to particular types of organism. Other people have challenged that paper based on looking at vegetation analyses and other types of organisms may not have that particular um, limit. But certainly the best available information we had in 2004 suggested that we were looking at between 25 and 35 percent extinction if you allow some dispersal limitations. So you allow that they can't get north of you know, Scotland, they can't get up into you know, further, further places in Scandinavia where there might be suitable habitats. But if, even if you assume there's no limits to dispersal, you still have 10% of species having no, nowhere where they can still live because of climate change. I worked a lot previously on understanding what happened post-glacially, so understanding what the consequences of glaciations were for species distributions. The issue with doing those kind of analyses is, is firstly, it's hard to see the things that didn't make it. So you've got a big ascertainment bias and you don't see, you always underestimate the amount of extinction that went on in the past. Um, you're also looking at species as single units again, you're not really seeing. The idea of focusing on species extinction is kind of a, it's, it's a natural thing to do, but it kind of really understates what's really happening. In terms of understanding how ecosystems work, what really matters is the way that populations decline and communities change in their in their composition because a species might still be found in the centre of its range but if it's contracting in all these peripheral areas it's basically essentially locally extinct. That means it's no longer part of the ecological network and those are much more serious in terms of ecological outputs than worrying about whether one species is still present somewhere on the planet or not. And by the time a species is just found in one population you've lost all that intra-specific genetic variation that's probably important for adapting or certainly important for adapting to change. So you're losing your capital in the sense of your ability to respond to change. But I think using species extinctions is a really poor currency for understanding the effects of climate change on biodiversity or the effects of habitat loss on biodiversity. Um, but we can look at what happened in the past where habitats where extinct mass extinctions happen because of rapid climate change or because of habitat loss. Um, and I think what we generally see, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert in this, but what I think we generally see is that similar types of organisms go extinct as those organisms which we now see on red lists that are very sort of in critically endangered. There's a lot of fantastic work being done by people like Georgina Mace looking at correlates of extinction risk in existing mammals and other people comparing it to past extinctions and other mammals. And you can sort of see the same traits come up, you know, it's, uh, if you've got a long gestation time, if you've got a large body size, if you're specialised in a particular type of diet, then you tend to go extinct much more quickly. Well, definitely carnivores, I mean, carnivores, I mean, you know, organisms that depend on, that are at top of food webs, if you like, or at high trophy levels, they tend to be more endangered. I mean, there are some exceptions to the red list in terms of, there are organisms which we should be really congratulating ourselves we've managed to make endangered, like cod. I mean, cod have a huge rate of increase. They're one of the real outlaws. They don't have the life history of an or endangered organism, but they are endangered because of the massive, huge amount of pressure that humans have basically put on them. So it's often quite hard to actually, like in, in looking at what's happened in the past, it's actually quite hard to look at correlates of extinction now because we've actually already lost a lot of the species that are already vulnerable. So there's a big filter. So we're actually looking at an ascertainment bias where we just see the species now that probably are fairly resilient. Uh, in the sense that we're only, we're not perceiving the full distribution, we're only seeing the organisms which, so there were previous organisms that went extinct thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago which we aren't included in our studies now. We can't study them, we can't include them. And that's also 
you know, presumably true when we look at, you know, what happened in the past as well. The fossil record only records widely distributed species going extinct, or, you know, um, species that are highly localised and show particular interactions. I mean, they are much harder to, to find evidence for, and they've probably already gone. You know, it's like, I guess it's like, you know, what well, I mean is, you know, it, in a way that acetamin bias means that you tend to, the rates of biodiversity loss are going to go down eventually because you'll lose the easy things to go, go first. It's like being burgled several times. You know, the first time you lose your, your, your computers and your iPhone or whatever, the next time, you know, it's other stuff. And, and by the time they've been there three, you know, you've had a, three rounds of extinction, you've basically got, you're only seeing the, quite, the things that nobody wants, you know, the things that are, are very hard to get rid of, hard to move. I mean, the, the UN Millennium Assessment, I mean, the Millennium Goals is to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss, but eventually it will be reduced. You know, and, you, and the ecosystems that have been highly degraded, you know, you find extinction rates go down because you lose the vulnerable species very quickly. People often say to me, well, extinction, you know, there's, what, five mammals gone extinct or something like that. But really, in terms of the... Um, it's about what we're trying to conserve, I guess, or what we're trying to... what we're interested in. And we're interested in the effects... Well, basically, we're interested in climate sensitivity, which is the degree to which a certain change in the environment is going to affect the way an ecosystem functions, what it, what it outputs, you know, um, in terms of things like water and rainfall and soil decomposition or pollination, these kind of things that people try and put an economic value on. And that involves understanding how communities are going to change. Now, communities of organisms interacting, it matters if that species is present at that point in space. Now, if the population has gone extinct in that particular part of its range, then that species is no longer existing in that community, no longer performing that role. So species, you know, this is why it's really important to look at species that are actually quite common, you know, and actually quite widely distributed, and then say, well, actually, they're declining at a very fast rate, and they're becoming much less common in particular places. The chance of finding it, if you go to this bit of habitat, is much less common, much, you're much less, less likely to find it now. I think one of the issues has been that biologists have kind of painted themselves in a corner a little bit because they argued for protecting very rare species. Like, you know, and then people say, well, these species look, you know, there's no way they're going to be protected. Look at tigers or pandas. I mean, look at the amount of money that has to go into protecting those. And you have to argue for their protection from a very ethical point of view and say, well, look, they've got a right to exist and they look at these beautiful animals or plants or whatever. But by the time a species is really extinct, endangered and it's only found in a couple of places, it can't really be participating in the ecosystems as a whole. You know, the, their value in terms of what they contribute to life and how their life depends on them. Because in most parts of their range, their former range, they're not there. So they're not part of the communities of interacting organisms, which is what is basically biodiversity. It's this kind of, you know, you go into a rainforest and basically it's full of these organisms interacting. And that's lost. I mean, population extinction is what matters for that situation. And also, if a population goes from being distributed across lots of habitats, and each habit, each population is adapted locally to that environment, it's got a lot of genetic variation, it's got a lot of genes that are present in some parts of the range that aren't present elsewhere. If the population shrinks down to a single remnant couple of populations, you've lost all those unique adaptations across the range, which are the testament of the history of evolutionary change over the last hundreds or thousands of years. So, it's that currency, it's that genetic variation within species that's going to allow us to allow those populations to persist where they are, to actually still continue to engage in ecosystems. Without genetic variation, there's, there's no evolution. So there's no capacity to evolve. And what we're doing at the moment is we're reducing biodiversity at just the point where we need it to adapt. We're, we're forcing it with massive you know, overconsumption and massive um, increases in population in, in the globe, but also huge rates of habitat loss as well as climate change. So we're destroying the, the, the very capital that's actually going to allow us to adapt and actually have these ecosystems continuing to operate in the future. So from the point of view of climate sensitivity, I mean, climate scientists are generating these fantastic estimates of exactly how the variation, how much the environment's going to change. But determining to what extent that's going to be catastrophic and over what time scale depends on knowing how organisms will react. And that's really a very different question. I mean, how close are we to tipping points? Do the tipping points even exist and how do they vary on a local or a global scale? How do they vary across ecosystems or in the marine environment versus the terrestrial environment? These are all questions that only biologists can really address. And a key part of that which we've been missing is the degree to which you can't assume a species has the same niche across its whole range. It actually has the capacity to adapt and do use the planet differently or use the environment differently and, and 
have different tolerances. This idea of problematic interactions, how species interactions are affected by climate change, that's a really key issue that is hard because the world is complicated. There's one of the things we really value about biodiversity is you know, it's these interactions between species. It's not just this species looks like this and, and lives here. It's actually the interactions it has with all the other things it interacts with in its lifetime. Um, and those things, particularly in seasonal environments, they depend on organisms synchronising their emergences or their emergence times or their behaviours with each other. And often there's conflicts there, because often and that's natural, and often like a plant is trying to prevent a butterfly laying its eggs on it and its larvae growing on its leaves. So there's like a bit of an arms race between the two where one's trying to emerge, particularly in the tropics, you see the, the um, plants are trying to sort of have their big growth of their leaves at a time when the insects aren't around. And the insects are trying to match, so they're trying to be, be around so they can produce a lot of young just at that time, so they can all feed on these, this rapid increase in biomass in the leaves. And that it always uses kind of these environmental cues, which is incredibly fantastic, amazing things that organisms do to match so they can survive winters. So they, can go, they know when to go and they, they use environmental cues to decide when to go into diapause, when to hibernate, and then when to emerge. Now, the difficulty is with climate change, those cues are no longer as coordinated as they were, they're no longer as useful. Um, so, for example, the temperature and the photo period, so the, the day length, is no longer has the same correlation that it used to have. It has a different correlation. And this means organisms may start to make mistakes. And, more, and so not only for their own survival, they have to actually come out at the right time to actually exploit their resources. So they have to emerge, say pollinators have to emerge at the same time as the flowers. Otherwise the flowers don't get pollinated and the, the insects don't get fed. Um, and that's a mutualistic interaction where you know, both organisms actually have a share the need to be pollinated and to be fed. But if you have a parasitic interaction or a herbivory type interaction, where one, say birds, you know, timing when they lay their eggs for their chicks to emerge for a time when there are, there are larvae around and caterpillars around that they can eat, or insects around that they can eat. So these different, if these different organisms in different trophic levels use different cues, which they do, and previously that actually was fairly reliable, you know, then, then that becomes a real problem because you get them emerging at different times. You're getting this thing called trophic mismatch, which people have been working on very nice systems in great tits. They're looking at um, moth species. That are, they're trying to track the, the, the bud burst of the trees and then, so they can grow their larvae. And, the, and the, the great tits are timing with their clutches when they lay their eggs so that their chicks have got... and they can feed their chicks with these larvae. And those things are becoming desynchronized because they're evolving at different rates or reacting in different ways to the environment. Actually, there were quite nice examples of humans using cues like when other animals do things to actually decide when to do things like planting rice in some traditional Chinese communities. They use the arrival of birds. It's beginning when birds start to nest as a cue, that's when we should start planting our rice because the birds have got a good sense of when it's going to be raining, when it's going to be productive, when the storms are going to finish. So, you know, there's all these, you know, organisms using cues from each other and using cues from the environment to time allow them to persist in places where the environment is sometimes harsh. And those cues are all basically being, you know, they're, they're changing. And we don't know how that's going to affect, how much organisms are going to be able to evolve in their way that they use the environment to actually cope with those changes. And the, the increasingly unpredictable nature of the environment. I mean, these seasonal changes are periodic. You know, you can sort of predict that there's going to be, and maybe, you know, the first time of a first frost is a good indicator of winter flower. But in the future, it might not be like that. And that's a real issue, I think, that we don't really understand. Well, I was always fascinated by evolution when I was a child, and I've always, I've always been really interested in trade-offs, actually, and in, in very interested in, in actually how behaviours evolve as well. So, um, behavioural ecology, when I was at a university, kind of this idea that you, you're trying to optimise your decisions that you make, and if you do make this decision, it compromises your ability to make another decision. That got me into thinking more generally about why this general question about, I mean, why do species have specialised niches? Why are species only found in one place and not in another place? You know, why in the past, you know, did you, do you not just have one species that just does everything? Why do species evolve and acquire certain phenotypes, certain ways of doing things, so does it stop them doing other things? We know evolution can achieve a lot, but why? Why are species limited in their, in, their, um, in their distributions? But I think the reason I got into what I'm doing now is really a lot of it was driven by 
by conservation and by being really quite shocked by the scale of biodiversity loss. Which I think is interesting because I think that's actually been downplayed in the media because there's been so much focus on um, addressing climate change denial and this idea of is climate change happening or not and if it is happening, which obviously it is, but if it is happening on a large enough scale to actually cause catastrophic change or not, that's been a real focus of, of scientific research and, and rightly so. But we know that habitats have been lost, we know that biodiversity is declining at an alarming rate. And I think that kind of idea of the biological uh, effects of human exploitation and human population growth, human overconsumption, has been slightly lost in the story, because, partly because people focus on species extinctions and not on the declines in abundance of species across their range and, and the interactions that are changing. And partly because I think people don't value the uh, nature as the thing that makes everything else possible. The fact that you know, if, you know, the environment is the economy. You know, it's the thing that we all get everything from. Life is what we depend on, and that life is being massively stressed. Uh, besides that, you know, we're losing biodiversity at precisely the time we need it the most. And so I think I was really up, upset, anxious about that when I was a teenager, and I studied biology because of that. Um, and I was also really fascinated by evolution. And now it's really exciting that evolution is actually one of the key things that might or might not allow resilience to things like environmental change. And it has done in the past. And we need to understand how much it can temper those critical tipping points that we can predict, or we can try to predict based on rates of climate change. But really, I mean, I go into it because I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, really, I'm, I'm a population geneticist, so I try and understand how populations really, how they respond to change, how they're able to track a changing environment. I, mean, I was at a party actually, and, uh, and somebody asked me why I chose to study, it was an astrophysicist, and she said to me, why, why, why are you choosing to study something that's so localised? It's only found on one planet as far as we know, and it's only existed for a very short period of time. I was like, okay, well, you know, because I was saying, well, I study life, you know, it's an amazing thing to study, because we're on this planet, you know, we might as well study life while we're here. And she was like, yeah, well, it's a very localised phenomenon. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't stay, it doesn't become more localised. I mean, I do do a lot of interacting with the public about these things. And actually, generally, I'm, I think people are generally very concerned, especially younger people, especially children. Something seems to happen to people when they get into their late teens or early 20s. They, interest in the environment seems to come back again in their 30s, and especially when they become grandparents and they can sort of see the length of their grandchildren are going to be alive in 70 years' time. Um, but there seems to be, I think there's a period when the consumer culture gets people and they sort of trade, they sort of, they, this culture of disappointment driving their, their expectations, they just, you know. Um, so they seem to, we seem, when you meet children who are like, you know, seven or eight up to about 13, they're really worried, they're deeply worried about the environment. So I think there is already like a great worry about it. And I think one of the problems actually that scientists have done is they, they present um, nightmares. They do basically make people afraid. I mean, the people have often said, you know, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare, he said, I have a dream. So it's aspirational, and people really feel powerless. So I think one of the things scientists can do is say, well, look, we know that this is a big challenge. We know the planet is facing big consequences of what humans are doing. Um, but there is ways that we can improve things. There's ways that we can reduce the impact. Um, I think scientists are fighting like a big, um, well, scientists, rationalists generally, are fighting kind of like a, an industry that's basically trying to maintain, convince everyone that everything's fine, we should just carry on as we are, and that's, that's got a lot of money behind it. Um, and actually, but I think the thing is, you know, we're, we're not, it's not making us happy, this, this, these things that we're doing, this consumption that we're doing. I don't meet people who, people don't really think, I don't think, that they're happy, happier than they were because of the consumption that they're doing. I mean, there's the, there's the quote that someone said, we're borrowing money, we can't afford to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't care about. Uh, but that machine is sort of driving us to do that. So I think what scientists can do is actually just, especially biologists, is to make people aware of how amazing, how wonderful things are, and communicate the reason we study these things because we're absolutely fascinated by them. And I think actually what I spend a lot of time trying to communicate to people as a scientist is that we're driven by doubt. We are, I mean, we're, we're skeptics. We, we question everything. And I think we get, we have to get across to the public the idea that scientists ask questions. They don't come up with facts and dry sort of proof. Science is about asking questions and questioning everything, you know, and, and having doubt. And, and uh, you know, every question, it needs to be answered. You know, 
scientists are, are, are not ever certain of anything. And I think the unfortunate, the unfortunate thing is that, slight, that lack of certainty, which is what allows science to continue, is sort of pounced on by people are saying, oh, this means they don't even know, there's no consensus. I mean, we, we know that um, to get 97% or you know, a very large number of scientists agreeing on something is an incredibly rare thing to happen. I, th I think the real tragedy is that people are missing out on so much by not having a, this kind of approach to things. It's actually the thinking that science is about just, just dotting I's and crossing T's and proving things with a big stamp, you know, rather than actually sort of engaging with the world and trying to you know, see beauty in it by understanding it more. I think in this country particularly, the, the media don't serve the public very well in terms of science. I think they underestimate. I talk to people, admittedly people who come to science fairs and things like that and come to you know, the public engagement events we do here. I talk to them about science a lot. And I'm always incredibly impressed by how much they know. The difficulty, of course, is they're the people that come to us. If you, if you go out and pick people around in the street, it might not be the same story. And I think with biodiversity, it's particularly, if you ask people in the street what biodiversity is, most people don't know. So I think we've really failed as scientists to get across, you know, that life is basically the thing that makes, that everything is, in, is within, it's the thing that makes everything possible. Like if I tell people, you know, that one in, only one in ten of the cells in your body is actually human, I mean, the people are like shocked by that. And that's telling you that we are actually ecosystems ourselves. We carry around, you know, tens of millions of organisms within us that are interacting in this ecosystem that we're just a platform for. And people think, well, I, I'm me. I say, well, most of the cells in your body are, are, not, are not you at all. And so who are you, you know? And people get, bit, people get you know, their mind um, swept by that. I can show, maybe I'll show you this as well. This is from a recent textbook on evolution. Uh, which came out a few years ago, which is really nice. It illustrates how much genetics has told us about the tree of life and about the history of life on this planet that we didn't know before. And this is basically a tree uh, based on uh, neutral markers, based on molecular markers, which tells us about the evolutionary history of the planet. And this point here is the, what we think is the last universal common ancestor about five billion years ago. And what this tells us, first of all, is that Darwin was absolutely right. Um, all life on this planet, all existing life on this planet, is related to a group of ancestors or a single ancestor five billion years ago. And it also tells us there's a lot of biodiversity we know very little about. This is biodiversity in bacteria, which are, this is, these are all the eukaryotes, all the, complex, all the forms of life that are multicellular, or most of them. And these are the archaea, and these are the bacteria. So have these three big kingdoms of life. And what I usually do with the first years uh, in one of their first lectures is, is point this up and ask them to put their hand up when they've seen where the animals are on this tree. If you look on this tree very carefully, you see the animals are just here. So this twig here, the tree of life, this is basically all the animals. That's not just all the mammals and birds, that's also all the coral reefs and worms and all the mollusks and all the, um, all the insects. So you can see there's actually most biodiversity is not animal. It's actually this sort of biodiversity, sort of biodiversity we might find in a handful of soil, some of these things. Just a handful of soil, a world and a grain of sand, so to speak. But actually, we didn't know that there was this much diversity in soil in bacteria because most of the bacteria we try and grow from a load of soil, we try and grow it on some agar and it wouldn't grow because it depends on quite complicated species interactions. So these forms of life, we can only find them when we actually sequence all the soil and find all the different lineages that exist in it. And so we find a lot of evolutionary history we know virtually nothing about. We focus so much in the last few thousand years on these animals here. There's land plants here. These are all the angiosperms would be in here. And you see they're flanked by algae, what we call green algae. Two types of green algae that are really divergent, and red algae. These are like kind of seaweeds, but they're incredibly divergent. Fungi are here, so these are all the fungi, or the mushrooms. They're quite closely related to animals. But there's all this biodiversity that we know very little about. And genetics is teaching us um, a huge amount about where the real um, evolutionary history is on the planet, these small things that run the world. But the government are driven by the public, you know, especially you know, in, in democratic systems. It's the public need to realise that they can actually do something and they can actually change how they spend their money or how they vote is actually going to have a huge effect. Convincing the government that these issues really matter and they matter for our children and for our grandchildren is really important. So people, I think the most important thing is to make people not feel powerless. That if you make, I mean, the environment has slipped off the agenda. You know, in, in politics, certainly in UK politics. I mean, this, um, maybe I shouldn't talk about this government in any detail, but you know, DEFRA, the, you know, the people that are responsible for the sustainability of the ecosystems that we depend on, they should—they're basically the treasury.
You know, they are the they are they have the wealth of the planet. You know, but the problem is we don't value that that wealth. We we value sort of financial wealth more, imports and exports, not the actual thing that makes that stuff possible. <laughs>